From News 8, your local news source, this is Breaking News. And that breaking news, one person is dead, another injured after a shooting on the near north side. Yeah, it happened just before 8 o'clock. Police called to 36th in Illinois, and that's where we find News 8's Julian Grace. And Julian, what have you learned? Mike, we have a lot of questions in this one, just not a lot of answers. According to police, they updated us, I want to say about 15 minutes ago. This all unfolded behind me, this crime scene around 740. Let me step out of the shot so you could get a better perspective as police work away trying to get additional details on how this all transpired. Let's go back through the details of the case on what police have shared with us. Around 740, they got the call for help. They arrived to the scene and they found one man dead, another man suffering multiple gunshot wounds. The surviving victim was rushed to the hospital. We're told he is in stable condition as far as the victim that died on the scene. Not a lot of details. We don't know name. We don't know the age, but we do know this. Police tell us there is a second possible location that is connected to this shooting. We saw police near 36 and Meridian canvassing the area, walking up and down the street, looking for possible shell casings, but they didn't say what they may or may not have found. That said, a number of possible family members and friends, they have arrived to the scene here, and their main objective is trying to find out if the victims may be someone they know or a relative. Of course, police could not give that information out. We can tell you also that the coroner, the Marion County Coroner's Office is out here uh, processing the scene as well. We do not know uh, when we will get another update from the police department. It possibly will not come down tonight uh, as they work to get more information. We did get a little bit more details. I talked to a number of people that were off camera that were in this area and some residents. Now, this has not been confirmed by police, but some residents believe this may involve some type of robbery. What that may entail, we do not know. But this stretch of Illinois near 36 in Illinois has been shut down since 740. And many of you in the community who are familiar with this area, you know, this is a very populated area. So around 740, you, you can just only imagine there are a number of kids still up. There are parents up. There are people watching TV, people eating dinner, kids working on homework. So police definitely want to piece this all together and find out who is responsible for firing multiple shots, taking one person's life, sending another person to the hospital in stable condition. This is what we are going to do. We're going to stay out here because this is a very fluid investigation. Any additional details that I receive you will hear about it on my Facebook page and of course on wishtv.com but for now Brooke and Mike that is all we know police know a little bit more just not willing to share it with us at this point guys all right we'll certainly continue to follow this one Julian thanks for the reporting tonight in other news new tonight Eli Lilly is developing a 90 million dollar building in its efforts to fight diabetes and help people that have it. Yeah, but what has drawn some questions whether the global pharmaceutical company should get nearly 10 million dollars in tax breaks from our city. News 8's Eric Feldman joins us now after going to a city council a committee meeting where we could be closer to an answer here, Eric. Yeah, they passed it tonight, so it's going to go to the full council for a vote, meaning that these tax breaks could be coming to Eli Lilly. So now it's going to be up to the full council for this vote that we are expecting in the near future. There's been a spotlight recently, especially after Amazon's second headquarters search about tax breaks for businesses bringing investment or jobs to cities. And even though it passed overwhelmingly, we heard some of those questions tonight. It's a Fortune 500 company making medicines used by many around the world for whatever they're fighting. Eli Lilly is headquartered in Indianapolis and has been for a long time. This may, in, uh, as a company, in Indiana, 144 years, and part of our uh, 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 job of making sure we're around for another 144 years is making sure we're the right size. Next, a $90 million investment to expand a building dedicated to creating insulin products, the hope to meet growing diabetes demand. Tonight, Eli Lilly reps went to the city council asking just south of $10 million in tax relief for their property taxes in this development. The representatives also talked about the investment over time in Indianapolis, a couple billion in Indiana facilities, millions to nonprofits, even now developing a park for the Circle City. They are being courted by other entities, um, other countries. It is refreshing to know their commitment to Indianapolis remains steadfast. But there's still concern about this request. The concern continues to be 
we offer abatements to Lilly. Mm -hmm. However, they continue to lay off Marion County employees, we've, we've and so we are, are terminated. So that's yeah. not what happened. No, no. Oh. The debate over some early retirements in 2017 and some jobs in Marion County that went to another company that Lilly sold. While Eli Lilly representatives couldn't say whether new jobs would be created yet, they say they want to keep growing here in Indiana. And a final vote will be coming at the next city council meeting. So, of course, we'll stay on top of this story. I'm Eric Feldman, Wish TV News 8. All right, Eric, thank you. New tonight, the Red Line construction project is getting some vocal support. Several dozen people gathered at 20 Tap in Broad Ripple tonight. They wanted to let Indianapolis leaders know that they want the Red Line and think it will positively impact the quality of life in nearby neighborhoods. We talked to one family who says they just bought a new home just in anticipation of this project. We knew that long term that the development of more frequent and reliable service was going to uh, allow us to maintain our lifestyle, allow us to get to school, get to work. We know that it's going to allow a lot of our neighbors who don't have the same opportunity that we had to intentionally make that decision to be a one car family and choose where we live. As we've reported, not everyone supports the red line. People living in the Meridian Kessler neighborhood, some are concerned that permanent changes will cause more traffic and speeding in that neighborhood. A neighborhood rally is set for tomorrow afternoon at 57th and Central. Developing tonight, Westfield city leaders are giving the Grand Junction Plaza project a green light. The city council approved funding for the $35 million park tonight. Well, plans for the six acre plaza include an outdoor performance area, a cafe, a child play area, and an ice rink. People living in Westfield had voiced their concern over the project, saying it would put uh, the city in more debt. Westfield Mayor Andy Cook has said the project is critical to the city's future construction. It's set to start this summer. All right, let's take a turn and look outside. Clear and chilly across uh, central Indiana tonight. But there are big changes in this forecast. Yeah, you might like them too. Wish to be <laughs> Chief Meteorologist Ashley Brown joins us now. Got a nice little warm up coming here. How about the 70s, right? Yes, like that. Yes, right, yes. Looking forward to it. The only issue here is that we'll have some showers. It's not an all day rain event when we get to 70. We'll talk about how we get there and when we get there. But tonight, just a little chill in the air. A quick reminder that it's still March. Temperatures right now at 37 degrees. Not too bad for Indy. You're at 37 for Columbus. You know, we made it to the upper 40s today. We were near 50 degrees. Yes, we had a light breeze, but yes, we had beautiful sunshine as well. All right, so let's talk about where we're going tonight. Temperatures will hold steady here in the 30s, continuing to feel colder. It feels like it's in the low 30s for Indianapolis. It feels like it's in the 20s for Kokomo. High pressure in control, and because of that, we're going to have a dry night. I would say mostly clear to partly cloudy, depending on your location. And when you see this number of 28, that's our overnight low or our morning low. We'll start there tomorrow morning before we'll be begin to warm up. Now, as you head out to work in the morning, send the kids out to school. It is a cold start, but it's March, right? Temperature started out in the 20s. It will feel like the low 20s there tomorrow morning. Once we get to around 11 o'clock, you'll notice things starting to warm up a bit, finally making it above freezing, I think, by about uh, noon there with the wind chills. Sun and clouds throughout the day and that sunshine. I know it's just a little at times, but it helps us to warm to the 50s tomorrow. We're not done warming once we get to the 50s. This warming trend takes us to the 70s by Thursday. We'll track the chances of rain and talk about that gradual warming trend coming up in just a few minutes. All right, Ashley, thank you. With temperatures a little all over the place this week, keep up with Storm Track 8 weather app. Gives you a quick, easy access to current conditions and hour by hour forecast and live interactive radar. It's free for the iPhone and Android. Just head to the App Store to get it. Well, developing tonight, Lebanon has a new police chief. Chad Morgan takes over the department immediately. Morgan began his law enforcement career in 1992. In 2018, he earned the Medal of Bravery and was named Officer of the Year for his actions in the incident that claimed the life of Boone County Sheriff's Deputy Jacob Pickett. Morgan takes over for Tyson Warmoth, who was demoted last week over a comment he made on Facebook two years ago. Changes in Jennings County after an inmate escaped custody earlier this month, according to the sheriff's office. While Kim Lynn Patton was uh, on his way to court, he was able to unlock his handcuffs. Investigators say he used a key taken from an inmate from the booking counter. Now, Sheriff Kenny Freeman says all escape risk will be transported with two jail officers. Only one was available for transport for Patton. There will be cameras in the transport vehicles and parking areas closer to the courthouse. Patton is back in custody. He was found the day after he escaped after a tip from someone in the community. He now faces additional charges. 
Smokable CBD products could be banned in Indiana if a Senate bill gather, gathers uh, enough support to pass the House. Part of a larger hemp regulation bill lawmakers are considering that would bring hemp production to Indiana. State Senator Randy Head says law enforcement asked for the change because it's so hard to tell the difference between CBD and marijuana flowers. The plants look almost identical but are actually very different. Law enforcement often doesn't know what they're looking at. Is this hemp or is this marijuana, for instance? Or you have people who could hide marijuana inside a hemp product or could get a, a container that they bought legal hemp in and put marijuana inside it uh, and transport it. And we don't want those things to happen. Um, I feel like it's unfair to the consumer because especially with the flour, it's the cheapest way, you know, dollar per milligram for people to um, get CBD. So that was Jeff Shelton. He co-owns the Happy Days Smoke Shops in town. Despite certain concerns, he likes the hemp bill overall for farmers. Senator Head says he's working on scheduling meetings with others from the CBD industry to try to find a solution. Carmel's men and women in blue going green. Why one expert says the police department's hybrid initiative may not be all it's cracked up to be. And a new hate crimes bill, the topic of a lot of discussion this session at the State House. How one study out of IU questions the potential effectiveness of the law. And fighting the opioid crisis in Indiana, how one new program in Hamilton County designed to help people struggling with addiction. You're watching Wish TV, your local news source, with Brooke Martin, Mike Barnes, meteorologist Ashley Brown, and Anthony Calhoun. Now, News 8 at 10 continues. Well, Carmel PD swapping out its fleet of standard patrol cars for hybrids. Carmel officials say it's a major money saving move, but experts aren't so sure. The city's planning to get 17 Ford Interceptor hybrids before the end of the year. Police say their plan is to switch out every patrol car by the end of 2024. The city estimates it'll save about $3,000 per year per car based on today's average price of gas in Indiana. The department has 130 cars. According to their calculations, that would mean saving $390,000 every year. Over the years, Carmel Police Department has really looked into technology, 
cost savings, making the officer's job more efficient. So that was Lieutenant Joe Bickle with the Carmel Police Department. We also talked to Philip Reed, a car expert, who wrote an article for Nerd Wallet about hybrids and how much money they'll really save you. Reed says the city of Carmel's estimated savings appear to be overprojected. Points out savings estimations are based, at least in part, on the price of gas, which Reed says is extremely volatile. Well, developing tonight, a Lafayette police officer accidentally shot by a fellow officer in January is expected to return to duty in four to six weeks. Now, according to Chief Pat Flannelly, Officer Lane Butler is expected to make a full recovery. As we've reported, Officer Butler and two other officers were searching for a person wanted on a warrant. During the search, a large dog broke out of its cage, and Officer Aaron Wright's gun fired, hitting Butler in the upper back. A review board ruled the shooting was an accident and not the result of negligence. Officer Wright returned to duty a few days after the shooting. In Crime Watch 8, a man is now in custody after crashing into a fire truck. 39-year-old David Bender faces a charge of operating a vehicle while intoxicated. He was arrested after being taken to the hospital to be checked out. Crash happened late last night on the city's east side on 38th Street near Emerson. IFD says the truck had its lights and sirens on when a car crossed the center line and hit it head on. The fire truck then hit a large gas station sign, a light pole, and several concrete barriers. Four firefighters were taken to the hospital to be checked out. They have since been released. The fire truck was destroyed. All right, time now for Monday's Most Wanted. Each week, Wish TV teams up with Crime Stoppers to help police find wanted criminals across central Indiana. This week, investigators are looking for your help finding this man, Marvin Adcock. He is wanted on the charge of possession of meth. To submit a tip, call Crime Stoppers at 317-262-TIPS. You can download the free P3 Tips app or visit crimetips.org. If your tip leads to an arrest, you could earn a cash reward. Well, despite the controversial hate crimes legislation taking center stage in the state house, a new study from Indiana University questions how effective any potential law would be. According to the study, charges weren't even filed in 70% of the potential hate crime cases researchers looked at. The Center for Research on Inclusion and Social Policy at the IU Public Policy Institute says even in states with biased crimes laws, biased homicides were not prosecuted equally. Their research shows se sexual orientation and gender identity homicides were less likely to be prosecuted as biased crimes than race or religion, for example. What we want to see is kind of equal representation, right? If we know that 30% of the crimes are associated with um, race, we want to see at least 30% associated that are actually charged and prosecuted. The research also states that there needs to be more done to support hate crime victims. Well, cracking down on opioids, that's the goal of a new program in Hamilton County. The county implementing the new program called the Opioid Quick Response Team. The team is made up of law enforcement officer, a firefighter, or a medic, and a peer recovery specialist. They will meet with Hamilton County overdose victims and try to get them into treatment programs. Officials say the program is needed. Over the past several years, opiate abuse has increased at an alarming rate in Hamilton County. In 2018, our 911 dispatch communications received 459 overdose calls. And unfortunately, 38 opioid overdose deaths confirmed in Hamilton County in 2018. Grants from the Indiana Department of Mental Health and Addictions are helping to fund the program. All right, uh, let's take a look outside at the circle tonight. It was a great day out there, wasn't there? And a big surge in temperatures right. coming. Sun was up for a long time today as well, so mm -hmm. we're, we're getting to the right spot now, it seems like. And uh, yeah, it was nice out there today, and it's going to get even, even better. I think tomorrow is a better day. Uh, if I had to pick, I would say tomorrow is the best day of the week. Here's right. why. Um, we're in the 60s on Wednesday. That is warmer. And we're in the 70s on Thursday. That's fantastic. But both days holds a chance of rain and even a few thunderstorms there. So tomorrow is kind of a dry day with a little sunshine that warms above average. So looking forward to it. If I compare right now to last night, I can tell you there's only a one degree difference. So we're in the mid to upper 30s out there, and that's actually pretty close to normal. Speaking of normal, we should really start our more Mornings in March at around 30 degrees. We're going to start you out tomorrow morning at 28 for Indianapolis. I know it says tonight in the overnight low, but we kind of track that through the overnight.
overnight hours is our morning low because the coldest time of the day right before sunrise 27 for Shelbyville there. All right, so temperatures tonight in the 20s, right? So we start tomorrow in the 20s, but with a mix of sun and clouds throughout the day. Hey, we're feeling better by the lunch hour. 38 degrees with the southeast wind, not much of a wind chill, but a slight one there. I think before noon, once we get to 4 p.m. 50 degrees and keep this in mind, we should be at 50 this time of year. That's what's normal for us. That's where we should be at uh, this time of year. All right, so Wednesday is the day that we warm to 60 degrees, which is something to look forward to, something to celebrate, but it comes by way of a few showers in the forecast for you. Here's how we track it. So very early on Wednesday, I think in the overnight hours, we'll see a few isolated showers kind of moving in here. These isolated showers continue to overspread the area. You know, I think Wednesday is a day that we see some rain early, but you also get some dry hours in here. It's not raining all the time throughout the day on Wednesday. You'll have some breaks from the rain at times. Winds, yes, we'll have those. It will become breezy as this week disturbance slides over the area. Now, we'll stay mainly dry, I think, on Wednesday night with a chance of a spotty shower or two. But once we get to Thursday, a stronger disturbance slides in. This brings a better chance of seeing some storms. Your Wednesday forecast showers early. That's the best chance for showers on Wednesday. At noon, we're in the upper 40s, and by about 5 p.m., I think we're at 60 degrees, so looking forward to that. All right, so here's Thursday. More rain, more wind, and warmer temperatures. Because of the warm-up, I think there's a possibility of seeing some isolated thunderstorms there on Wednesday. As we see these thunderstorms slide through, I think some gusty winds, very gusty at times, as we see kind of a change in the atmosphere here. Isolated thunderstorms are possible on your Thursday. I think the primary components here, what we're going to expect and what we're going to watch is the possibility of some strong winds and some heavy rain. This is Thursday throughout the day, the day of stronger storms, but it's also that day that we hit 70 degrees. So looking forward to that warm up. But yes, there is a trade off for it. Look at this forecast. 70 that stands out and you're thinking, how do we go from 70 to 44 in 24 hours? A cold front. It slides through, and that's responsible for those gusty winds, the friction in the atmosphere, and all the change that we see. Chapman Heating and Cooling eight day forecast here. So, tomorrow is my pick of the week. It's the drier day. It is not the warmest day. Those showers and storms on Thursday lingering into Friday morning with colder air in place. Temperatures only in the 40s. The coolest day in this forecast going forward is Saturday at only 40 degrees, but we'll warm right back up headed into St. Patrick's Day. And next week we'll see temperatures that are more typical of where they should be this time of year, the upper 40s and low 50s. Thanks, Ashley. For the first time in the history of the Big Ten, the Player of the Year award did not go to the league's leading scorer and conference champ. Find out who took home the award coming up next.
All right, the regular season has come to an end in men's college hoops. Conference tournaments taking place this week. Which means it is time to give out some regular season awards, including Big Ten Player and Coach of the Year, of course. Megan McEwen joins us now at the very latest on who took on the hardware. Shocker. Uh, I know. There were some shocking uh, things that happened in regards to this. So, uh, Romeo Langford was honored by the Big Ten. Matt Painter honored, but something shocking with Carson Edwards that people didn't necessarily expect. The Big Ten announced season ending awards. Michigan State guard Cassius Winston edged Purdue guard Carson Wet Edwards out for player of the year. Edwards now the first player in Big Ten history to lead the league in scoring, win the title, and not win player of the year. Edwards did, however, pick up all Big Ten first team accolades. IU forward Romeo Langford named second team all Big Ten. Purdue head coach Matt Painter named Conference Coach of the Year, Painter's fourth Big Ten Coach of the Year honor. We've had a good year, and I'm really proud of our guys. And uh, you know, to be able to struggle non-conference and, and be six and five at one point, and then be able to, you know, go 16 and four in our league, and it's such a grind. You know, uh, great coaches, great players. Um, it's tough on the road. Uh, I'm just proud of our guys. Obviously, we were undefeated at home this year. Uh, just hanging in there and getting better each game. Our very own Charlie Clifford will be in Chicago covering the Big Ten tournament. Be sure to tune into Wish TV for the latest from the Windy City starting on Wednesday. He'll have you covered on the Hoosiers and the Boilermakers. IU, the nine seed, play in Ohio State on Thursday. Purdue, the two seed. We're going to find out who they play later in the week, but they'll play Friday. All right, need some wins there as well to Absolutely. hopefully get into the big dance. I know, IU alum right here. I know. Really hoping for a big need a couple of wins, happen. I think. Absolutely. Thanks, Megan. Mm -hmm. All right, the Madison March now underway. That means you'll likely soon be filling out your brackets. You can find one at wishtv.com as part of our basketball bracket bonanza. You'll have a chance to win an iPad, $400 gift card, and four tickets to Indy 11th. You can also see how you do compared to the Wish TV team right here. To sign up, head to our website, click on the contest page. You don't have to wait to register. You can do it all right now. We'll send you reminders to fill out your bracket once it's finally posted. All right, in a quiet night, cold conditions, a few clouds increasing over the area, also increasing the temperature trend. We're going to check out a gradual warming trend that takes us to the 70s in the extended forecast. That's all coming up. And a shooting on the near north side of Indianapolis. One person is dead, another injured. We're live from 36th and Illinois with the latest on the case. Another $8 billion for border wall funding. We're digging into the president's budget requests and why Democrats say it's a non-starter.
from News 8, your local news source. This is breaking news. Twice of breaking news tonight on the near north side of Indianapolis. One person is dead, another injured after a shooting near 36th and Illinois. News 8's Julian Grace is live there for us tonight. Julian, what do you know? Well, Brooke, at this point, we do not have any new details to share with you, but let me walk you back through on exactly what we know According to IMPD, what you're looking at behind me, that is the crime scene, and that unfolded around 740 tonight. Police got a call for help. They arrived to the scene and found one man dead in a car, and then there was a second man who suffered multiple gunshot wounds. He was rushed to the hospital. He is expected to survive. We're told he is in stable condition. Now, how did this all unfold, or what precipitated this? Police are being very vague at this point, not giving out a lot of details, but we are told that there are multiple scenes connected to this case. The other scene was near 36 and Meridian. Earlier, we watched officers walk up and down the sidewalk looking for possible shell casings, uh, but they would not comment any further about exactly the connection here. There are also a number of residents that are out here, residents, possibly family members, possibly friends. They were waiting to get information from the police department on possible identification. In fact, at one point, uh, some potential family members, they were so frustrated that they walked past the crime scene tape and immediately officers came up to them and escorted them back and they simply just wanted to know more information. So. A lot of questions out there, just not a lot of answers. We're hoping to get additional details from IMPD here in the near future and also the Marion County Corner. But what we can tell you is one person is dead, another person rushed to the hospital in stable condition, and then there's a number of residents out here in this community. They just want answers because, as you know, this is a very populated area. And as far as Illinois Street is concerned, it has been shut down since 740. What you see right here is cars going, trying to go down the street. Now they have to turn off here on 36th Street to try to get around this investigation. So we are out here. Alex and I are photojournalists, and we are not going anywhere because this is still a very fluid investigation, and we could possibly receive another update from IMPD. So until then, we will toss it back to you guys in the studio. The moment we know any new information, you can read all about it, of course, at wishtv.com. Brooke and Mike. All right, Julian, we'll see you back here at 11 as well. All right, taking a turn, looking at the forecast. Spoil alert. 70. We are heading for above average temperatures for a change. We got a couple of days before that happens. Although tomorrow looks pretty good. Ashley Brown joins us now with the very latest on the near future. Yeah, you know, tomorrow temperatures at around 50 with sunshine. By the time we get to 70, we're tracking rain, but the warm up is still fantastic. Getting a view outside right now and checking out the satellite and radar, you know, we're pretty quiet right now. We're going to stay quiet throughout the night and into tomorrow as well. What's responsible for that quiet weather? Well, it's our friend high pressure. That system has been clearing and drying throughout the day today, and it brought us that beautiful sunshine. I think it'll bring us a little sunshine tomorrow as well. Temperatures at 37 degrees right now for Indianapolis. You're at 34 for Kokomo, about 37 for you and Columbus. So you're in the 30s. It feels slightly colder when you factor in that wind chill. And overnight tonight, I think temperatures in the upper 20s to start your day tomorrow. So as temperatures dip, yes, we're all Always colder right before sunrise as we go over tomorrow's forecast for you. Those temperatures start out in the upper 20s to mid 20s, depending on your location. And as you go through the day, here's what we're tracking. A cold start to the day with temperatures in the upper 20s, feeling like the low 20s. We're back into the 50s by afternoon and we're going to increase cloud cover throughout the day, starting with a little sunshine, but ending the day mostly cloudy. All right, with the 20s. 70 and everything in between in this forecast. Make sure you have the Wish TV weather app. It puts current conditions in hour by hour forecast, live interactive radar in the palm of your hand. You can get it from the App Store for free. It's free for the iPhone and the Android. Well, the president's budget requests an additional $8.6 billion to continue construction on the border wall. Yeah, Anna Wernicke reports Democrats in the House of Representatives are already saying that part of that budget simply will not pass. President Donald Trump's 2020 budget has arrived on Capitol Hill, and he's asking Congress for $8.6 billion in border wall funding. Every time you turn around, he's asking American taxpayers to come up with billions of dollars more 
for something that's really uh, an election year fantasy. Texas Democratic Congressman Roy Doggett is on the budget committee. He says he's ready to nix that number to zero as soon as he gets his hands on it. Well, I'd like to see no money. Uh, I, I certainly uh, believe in investing in reasonable security measures to try to prevent uh, drugs from coming into our country and other smuggled goods. The budget committee will begin a marathon of hearings this week to tackle each aspect of the president's budget, including the wall. But Doggett says good luck getting it through Congress, especially now that Democrats are in control of the House. Whether you call it a wall or a fence, whether it's steel or concrete, wasting money going across the desert is a real mistake. But acting director of the OMB, Russ Font, says the money is crucial to stop the crisis at the southern border. Federal resources and frontline defenders are overwhelmed at the southern border. And the fiscal year 2020 budget provides sizable funding of an $8.6 billion for full completion of the wall and other border security resources. Doggett says he expects the House to vote on the budget in April. In Washington, I'm Anna Warnicke. You, more than 2,000 immigrants in U.S. custody are under quarantine for being exposed to a contagious disease. In the past year, health inspectors have investigated 51 detention facilities for mumps, chicken pox, and influenza. It's according to Immigration and Customs Enforcement. During that time period, the reported cases of mumps grew from 0 to 236. Just in Texas, officials say nearly 200 people have contracted the virus since October. The agency says it is committed to ensuring the welfare of all of those in custody with comprehensive medical care. Well, daylight saving time may have you thrown you for a loop this weekend as we set our clocks forward an hour. And now President Trump says he doesn't mind stopping it. He tweeted out Monday, making daylight saving time permanent is okay with me. But if he wants to eliminate the legal requirement of falling back an hour each year, he will need congressional approval. Most states actually observe eight months of daylight saving times and just four months of standard time. A common justification for keeping the time change is the belief that Americans use less energy with extended summer daylight hours, but studies have found that's not the case. In Crime Watch 8 tonight, police in Marion have arrested two people for the shooting death of Cheryl Mann. Their 32-year-old Krista Kelly and 32-year-old Robert McCarty. Police arrested them this morning after getting a tip about their whereabouts. Shooting happened Saturday at a mobile home park on the west side of Marion. Police say Mann's grandson was also shot but survived. Avon police have arrested three teenagers for an armed burglary of a home. 18-year-old Brandon Captain Gamma is one of those that were arrested. He's an Avon High School student. The other two are juveniles and students at Ben Davis High School. Surveillance video captured two of the suspects inside the home taking a big screen TV. Police believe at least one of them had a gun. Police did recover the TV and returned it to the owners. IMPD arrested two people after a chase by car and on foot. The chase started just after 3.30 on the southeast side when officers spotted a stolen car. They tried to pull the driver over, but he sped away, eventually stopped near Oxford and Wade, where he got out and then ran. Police captured him minutes later, as well as a passenger. Now, the names of those arrested have not been released. The FAA requiring design changes after a plane crash that killed 157 people. The timeline to put the safety enhancements in place. And new cases of the measles, the latest numbers from the CDC.
You're watching Wish TV, your local news source, with Brooke Martin, Mike Barnes, meteorologist Ashley Brown, and Anthony Calhoun. Now, News 8 at 10 continues. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is reporting new cases of the measles. The agency says at least 228 cases of measles have been reported across the U.S. this year in 12 states now. The newest, New Hampshire, with one patient as of March 1st. Two of the larger outbreaks are in Washington State and New York. People in Oregon, Hawaii, and Georgia were infected in Washington, and New York reports 11 uh, new cases stemming from an outbreak after an unvaccinated resident became infected abroad. The disease was eliminated in the U.S. in 2000, but is common in many other countries, which is how the current outbreaks started. Well, the Federal Aviation Administration is now responding to growing concerns over Boeing's 737 MAX 8. So a crash in Ethiopia killed all 157 people on board. The same type of jet crash last year, killing 189 people. Kim Hutcherson reports. They were to go and uh, enjoy the animals um, and, and so forth. So uh, with the marriage break, uh, this was a perfect opportunity for them to show them. So Tragedy in the sky sparks a dire warning from aviation experts. I've never said that, hey, it's unsafe to fly a particular model of aircraft. But in this case, I'm going to have to go there. So, yeah. I would watch for that airplane. Multiple airlines around the world are grounding Boeing 737 MAX 8 planes following a second crash in less than six months. Two major U.S. airlines, Southwest and American Airlines, fly the MAX 8 and say they will continue to do so for now, leaving some passengers uneasy. People were nervous, uh, reading a lot of reading uh, on the paper and also on uh, the Internet. The FAA says it's too early to tell whether the two crashes are linked. However, they're ordering Boeing improve the flight control systems on the MAX 8 and 9 by next month. We already have we, uh, the, the return flight booked, so... Uh, if we could change it without any fee, I guess we would do it. Passengers scheduled to fly on MAX 8s in the U.S. do not have many options. The airlines are making no adjustments to their change in cancellation policies. I'm Kim Hutcherson reporting. Preventing suicide among service members, veterans groups make their case to lawmakers. And we're going to have a quiet night for you, but chilly. Temperatures will fall to the upper 20s in the overnight hours, but a nice warming trend takes our temperatures to the 70s by Thursday. We'll talk about how we get there and track the chances of rain before we get there. That's coming up.
Veterans groups have a to-do list for lawmakers. Top on the list is veteran suicide prevention. Yeah, Bree Jackson reports veteran groups say female veteran combat uh, commit rather suicide at nearly twice the rate of civilians. They've survived overseas combat, but the mental health battles veterans face can be as deadly as war itself. Domestic violence, homelessness, all of these factors combined um, can be the reason why women veterans are choosing to commit suicide. Teresa Jackson with the nonpartisan group AMVETS says females who served are nearly twice as likely to take their own lives compared to civilian women. Jackson believes a lack of awareness about VA resources is partly to blame. It's when they feel like suicide is the way out. They're not, they have, they don't have that support. They don't have someone to be able to help them out of that crisis. Earlier this month, the Trump administration established a new task force aimed at identifying ways to improve services for veterans. In addition, the president's proposed 2020 budget includes more than $9 billion for services, including mental health programs and suicide prevention efforts for veterans. Government can't do it alone. We're all in this together with the best interests at heart. Brian Dempsey with the Wounded Warrior Project says collaboration is critical. He urges lawmakers to work with veterans groups to make sure programs and legislation, including the VA Mission Act Congress passed last year, work. So what the Mission Act is going to do is find new ways and more efficient ways of getter, getting veterans access to quality care. Supporters say expanding health care services outside the VA is a key step to suicide prevention efforts, but their mission isn't complete. Advocates and lawmakers want to make sure veterans are getting the health care services they need. In Washington, Bree Jackson. All right, let's take a look outside. Circle, and it's pretty nice out there tonight. It was a, a beautiful day. That's great to start to work week with. Yeah, I think a lot of us, even the ones who have been skeptical about spring arriving, uh, mm -hmm. thought, you know, th today gave us that hope. The yeah, hope. it did. It did. You know, uh, and we're going to see some 70s here in the forecast. I like that. Some 60s, so a nice warm up. Uh, just kind of like, you know, before we settle into spring, we usually see this pattern to where we're up, we're down, we're up, we're down, and then we settle into being up. So I'm glad to see kind of this fluctuation in temperatures because it gives us a sign. <laughs> but, but you're not celebrating yet. I'm not celebrating yet because okay. I do think we'll have a few more temperatures dips before we hold steady with those 60s and 70s. All right, so let's talk about how warm it will be. All right, so the warmest temperature so far this year, 62. That was back on February 3rd. You guys remember that warm start we had the February? That was great. And then we took a big dive at the end of February there. But on Thursday, we're at 70 degrees. So Thursday will be the warmest day of the year. The only issue here is that it's a bit of a trade off because our 70 degree day will come by way of a few showers, a few thunderstorms, and even some very gusty winds in the forecast for you. Temperatures right now at 37 degrees for Indianapolis. We're at 32 for you as what it feels like for you in Indianapolis. So 34 for Kokomo, feeling like 27. Temperatures at around 37 for Columbus, feeling like 31 there. So a chill in the air for some tonight. As you go throughout the overnight hours, these temperatures continue to fall. I think we're down into the low 30s by midnight, starting you out tomorrow with temperatures in the upper 20s to start your day. High pressure remains in control, which means that we're dry and uh, mainly calm. You know, at times there's a light breeze out there, but tomorrow a pretty decent day. You will notice as we start really warming up, some white kind of slides in here. That's the cloud cover. I think we'll thicken the cloud cover by late afternoon tomorrow, but tomorrow is still my pick of the week. Why will I pick tomorrow, even though there's warmer days in the forecast? Because tomorrow is the day that I can count on. I think it's mainly dry. I think we can see some sunshine there with a temperature of 50 degrees, which is near normal and where we should be this time of year. As far as when we get into Wednesday, yes, it's warmer, but take a look at this. Scattered showers developing over the area, bringing some rain. Those rain showers will start you out in the morning. I think the best chance of rain on Wednesday is very early in the day. These showers kind of slide across the area, bringing wet weather to the forecast for you on your Wednesday morning. Once we get to Wednesday afternoon, uh, we'll work in some drier air briefly, but still dealing with cloudy skies and some gusty winds. Winds will kind of stick around with us on your Wednesday. So Wednesday system is kind of a weak disturbance bringing rain. I think there's a stronger system that will bring some rain to us on Thursday. So Thursday, 
showers and thunderstorms. Wednesday, just a few showers. Temperatures at 60 degrees, so enjoy this warming trend. As far as the warming trend taking us to the 70s, that happens on Thursday. Some isolated thunderstorms. We'll track those storms uh, and see if there's a possibility of severe weather. Right now, I'm looking at some heavy downpours and some gusty winds. The cold front slides through and we're colder on your Friday. Your Chapman heated and cooling eight day forecast here. Temperatures down to 40 by Saturday, St. Patrick's Day on Sunday. We'll have a mix of sun and clouds and we'll start to warm things back up. You know, next week, I think we're going to have a much more typical forecast. No, the 70s, they're not typical for this time of year. It's above normal, but we will settle in to more normal temperatures next week. But for now, hey, enjoy that warming trend that we have in the forecast. It takes you all the way to 70 by Thursday. All right, Ashley, thanks. Coming up, a woman attacked by a jaguar at an Arizona zoo. Find out why she's now the one apologizing over the incident. And we're getting a closer look at the U.S. women's national team uniforms for this summer's FIFA World Cup. The reveal and what the new look represents after the break. New tonight, UFC star Conor McGregor is in legal trouble again. Florida police arrested him this afternoon for stealing a cell phone of someone trying to take his photo. Happened in Miami Beach. Police say McGregor slapped the phone out of the man's hand, then stomped on it, grabbed the phone, and left. Police later found McGregor at his local address. He's now charged with robbery and criminal mischief. McGregor returned to the UFC last fall. He had been suspended from UFC for six months and fined $50,000 for a brawl back in October. A woman who was attacked by a jaguar is now apologizing to the zoo it happened at. The woman had crossed a barrier to take a photo of herself with the animal. The video shows the aftermath of the attack. It happened at the Wildlife World Zoo Aquarium in Safari Park in Phoenix, Arizona on Saturday. A witness says the Jaguar reached out and attacked the woman's arm. Another woman says she used a water bottle to distract the animal and let it go. The woman suffered deep cuts but later came back to the facility. The zoo spokeswoman says she apologized, felt badly uh, about the publicity the zoo was getting. Zoo officials say the Jaguar will not 
be euthanized. NASA plans to study moon samples from the final three Apollo missions for the very first time. The samples have sat untouched for nearly 50 years. The 1.8 pounds of rock layers from Apollo 15, 16, and 17 have never been exposed to the Earth's atmosphere. One is from the moon's core. It was delivered to Earth in a vacuum-sealed drive tube in 1972. The other samples have been kept frozen or stored in helium. NASA says this research can prepare them for the next exploration of the moon and beyond. Well, Apple could roll out some new technology this month. The company announced a new event set for March 25th with the tagline, it's showtime. Apple used the same phrase to hype a 2006 event where it gave a first look at the ITV that later became Apple TV. Industry watchers expect Apple to use the event to announce TV streaming services and Apple News subscription services. And it's also possible Apple could unveil retooled AirPods, the new entry level one uh, should entry level iPad and their air power wireless charging pad. Well, the mother bald eagle is now keeping watch over two eggs in her nest. We told you about the uh, egg last week, the first egg. The second one arrived on Saturday. The world is keeping track of the eggs. They're located in the Big Bear Lake, California area. Both parent eagles will now tag team the job of incubating the eggs. The National Forest Service says they should hatch by the middle of next month. Well, St. Patrick's Day celebrations are going to be less spirited this year, according to the National Retail Federation. Each person will spend about 40 bucks for the holiday, mostly on food and drinks. The entire day should bring in about $5.61 billion to the economy. That's uh, below, actually, not last year's total of nearly $6 billion. The biggest spenders will be between 18 and 34 years old. All right, trending tonight, we know what the U.S. Women's National Soccer Team will look like at this summer's FIFA World Cup. The team at Nike unveiled these new kits today. The collection features a stripe sleeve cuff like those worn by American soccer greats Brandi Chastain, Mia Hamm, and Julie Foudy. The shirt also has three stars above the uh, crest in honors to 1991, the 1999, and the 2015 world titles. The back panel is formed with the words of all 50 states, and the away team uniform will be all red with an abstraction of the American flag. I like it. I like it too. Two it looks thumbs good. up.